Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. Scenic View. Every year, the mountains get paler and more distant, trees less green, rock piles disappearing, as emulsion from a billion Kodaks sucks color out. In 15 years, Monadnock and Kearsarge, the green mountains and the white, will turn invisible, all tint removed, atom by atom, to albums in Medford and Greenwich, while over the valleys, the still intractable granite rears with unseeable peaks, fatal to airplanes. Welcome. I'm Henry Lyman, and we're visiting poet Donald Hall on the New Hampshire farm he lives on, which belonged to his grandfather and great-grandfather before him, and where Mount Kearsarge can be seen through the kitchen window. Another mountain called Ragged Mountain rises just behind the house, and summer and fall, as the poem suggests, the region fills with cameras and tourists. But the poem has to do with something more than tourism. It's about the environment. It is about acid rain, as it were. It's about how we uh, tend to destroy the things we love to look at, uh, uh, partly in the process of looking at them. So sure, it's about tourism in the sense that it's about what the uh, automobile and its exhaust uh, does to the forest, not just acid rain. You know, the poem also reminds me of the fear that is shared by certain primitive peoples Uh, so-called primitive peoples, yeah. that um, having their photograph taken is going to rob them of their soul. <laughs> sure, sure. It does sound like that, doesn't yeah, it? The yeah. soul of the hills and so on. And I think probably that within me, at somewhere or other, there is a fear of machines, and a fear of technology, that this uh, poem um, partly represents. The soul of the landscape in the poem stays. It can't be stolen. Yeah, uh-huh. the soul is still there, yeah. fatal to airplane. Right, granite. Granite and grass. On ragged mountain, birches twist from rifts in granite. Great ledges show gray through sugar bush. Brown bears doze all winter under granite outcroppings, or in cellar holes, the first settlers walled with fieldstone. Granite markers recline in high abandoned graveyards. Although split by frost or dynamite, granite is unaltered. Earthquakes tumble boulders across meadows. Glaciers carry pebbles with them as they grind south and melt north, scooping lakes for the Penacook's trout. Stone bulks reflect sunlight, bears snow, and persists. When highway makers cut through a granite hill, Scoring deep trench sides with vertical drillings, they leave behind glittering sculptures, monuments to the granite state of nature, emblems of permanence that we worship in daily dis-ease and discover in stone. But when we climb Ragged Mountain past cordwood stumpage, over rocks of a dry creek bed in company of young hemlock, only granite remains unkind. Uprising in summer, in woods and high pastures, our sister the fern breathes, trembles, and alters, delicate fronds outspread and separate. The fox pausing for scent cuts holes in hoarfrost, Quails scream in the fisher's jaw, then the fisher dotes. The coy dog howls, raising puppies that breed more puppies to rip the throats of rickety deer in March. The moose's antlers extend, defending his wife for a season. Mother and father grass lifts in the forsaken meadow, grows tall under sun and rain, uncut, turns yellow, sheds seeds, and under a salt of snow, relents. In May, green generates again. When the bear dies, bees construct 
honey from nectar of sink foil growing through rib bones. Ragged Mountain was granite before Adam divided. Grass lives because it dies. If weary of discord, we gaze heavenward through the same eye that looks at us. Vision makes light of contradiction. Granite is grass in the holy meadow of the soul's repose. The poem seems to imply that the separation we make between the permanent and the impermanent, between granite and grass, is somehow uh, only just one way of perceiving things, that there's another way of looking. Yeah, the poem uh, is my own attempt at resolving the conflict between the noble permanence of the granite on the one hand and the loving kinship of the frail and uh, dissolving uh, organic world on the other hand. It resolves this debate, finally, by looking at it, uh, as it were, from a divine perspective. Through the eye of the universe, so to speak? Well, let's say that the, that the unchangingness, or the, the relative unchangingness, of the, of the lump of granite, which uh, stays in its uh, molecular construction the same for millennia, the difference between that and the unchangingness of the sea, the waves uh, are constantly different and therefore always the same. The sea of uh, mortal life, of the uh, dying and being born again. The distinction between those two forms of permanence, the, the permanence of change and the permanence of no change, turns out to be a trivial difference uh, from the point of view of um, eternity. Yes, it occurs to me that if the universe had eyes, could see all of itself simultaneously, it would not see any beginnings, it would not see any ends. Perhaps it would only just see one long motion. It seems to me that the experience of the cancellation of time, the cancellation, therefore, of change and ideas even of endurance, is a mystical experience which is a kind of union with um, the divine. This is an experience which my poetry constantly reaches for. A Sister on the Tracks Between Pond and sheep barn, by maples and watery birches, Rebecca paces a double line of rust in a sandy trench, striding on black, creosoted eight by eights. In 1943, war trains skidded tanks, airframes, dynamos, searchlights, and troops to Montreal. She counted cars from the stopped hay rack at the endless crossing. Ninety-nine, one hundred. And her grandfather Ben's voice, shaking with rage and oratory, told how the mighty Boston and Maine kept the state house in its pocket. Today, Rebecca walks a line that vanishes, in solitude, bypassed by war and commerce. She remembers the story of the buntinged day her great-great-great-grandmother watched the first train roll and smoke from Potter Place to Gale with fireworks, cider, and speeches. Then the long rail drove west, buzzing and humming. The hive of rolling stock extended a thousand-card perspective from Ohio to Oregon, where men who left stone farms rode rails toward gold. On this blue day, she walks under a high jet's glint of swooped aluminum pulling its feathery contrail westward. She sees ahead how the jet dies into junk and highway wastes like railroad. Beside her, the old creation retires, Hayrack sunk like a rowboat under its fields of hay. She closes her eyes to glimpse the vertical track that rises from the underworld of graves, soul's ascension connecting dead to unborn, rails that hum with a hymn of continual vanishing where 
tracks cross. For she opens her eyes to read on a solitary gravestone next to the rails the familiar names of Ruth and Matthew Bott, born in a Norfolk parish, who ventured the immigrants' passionate exodus westward to labor on their own land. Here love builds its mortal house, where today's wind carries a double scent of heaven and cut hay. She has vision, the sister on the tracks. And uh, she sees the past, the old war trains that came through, which she counted, uh, which perhaps you counted yes, when you were a yes. young man. Her experience is very strangely similar to my own. <laughs> yes. She seems to be in touch with a kind of continuous present, uh, where everything by crosses the end of it, simultaneously. By the know? end, I hope she is, yes. yeah, And that simultaneity of old time and present time now, uh, that uh, cancelling out of uh, sequence is certainly something that my poems uh, seek, look for, find. Sometimes uh, w when I've been working on the poem, I have no idea that's where I'm going to go. But that is where the poem takes me. I often feel, over the months and years that I spend working on a poem, that I'm waiting for it to take me someplace. I feel uh, as if it's the leader. I know that's you know, not literally true. This is all coming from me someplace, but it's parts of me that I'm not uh, thoroughly aware of, consciously aware of, and I need the uh, the help of my language and uh, imagery uh, amounting to, to symbolism, I suppose, uh, to show me the way. Hmm. If I wait on it, usually I'll find it. Where are the tracks today? They're about... Um, 80 yards um, west of us as we sit here, and they're not used anymore. When we first moved to this farmhouse about 15 years ago, we had a train up every Thursday morning and back every Thursday afternoon. Moved pretty slowly, but uh, let's see, the last one was probably about five years ago, and I don't think they went over six miles an hour. Tomorrow. Although the car radio warned that War threatened as Europe mobilized. We set out for the World's Fair on the last day of August, 1939. My grandparents came visiting from New Hampshire to Connecticut once in three years. It wasn't easy to find somebody to milk the cows, to feed the hens and sheep. Maybe that's why we went ahead, with my father driving down the new Merritt Parkway towards Long Island. I was ten years old. For months I had looked forward to this trip to the fair. Everywhere I looked, I saw the Trilon and Parisphere, on ashtrays, billboards, and Dixie cups, in life. Those streamlined structures that stood for the world of tomorrow, when Dad would auto-gyro to pick up Rick and Judy from a school so modern it resembled an Airstream trailer. As we drove home late at night, it was already morning in Warsaw. I tried not to let my eyes close. My dear grandfather, wearing a suit instead of overalls, my grandmother with pearls from newberries, held my hand tight in silence. Soon I would fall asleep as we drove down the parkway. But first we stopped and started through city blocks, grave in the Pontiac heading north toward Connecticut. Past newsboys, hoarse, dark, and ragged, flapping papers at the red lights of intersections. Did you ever actually get to see that World's Fair? We did go down, um, my father driving on the Merritt Parkway, uh, with my grandparents from New Hampshire in the car. Uh, on the at the end of August, so that when we came back late at night, it was already September first, and Hitler had invaded Poland. Mm -hmm. Your grandparents are very important symbol or representation of the old creation, yeah. the old yeah. world, yeah. which stands in such contrast to what's about to happen 
in Europe. And the, the, the tenderness and affection yeah. uh, of, of them, uh, the protectiveness uh, of them against this. Uh, and then there is, uh, of course, the, the ideal technological future of the Trilon and Parisphere and so on against the real future, which is uh, mobilization and tanks. Your grandparents also stand in contrast to, to the fair itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Their world is not the world of tomorrow, not this no. uh, world of of, uh, of trilons and paraspheres. But, no, there's um, something to measure measure it with, mm-hmm. to measure against it yeah. too. You know, the whole poem accelerates at the end. Yeah. It's, it gets faster and faster as you, as the car stops and starts its way through these these city blocks, yeah. past these these newsboys waving. There's a strange apparition of the newsboys. There's something quite diabolical about them yeah. because of, of their they waving those newspapers yeah. by the red light. They're flapping like bats, yeah. Yeah. you know, in the darkness, and, uh, in the it's, red lights. It's almost as if you are moving through a kind of inferno. Right, the end. right, to try to get back to safety. Yeah. Here are some stanzas from a long poem called uh, Praise for Death. By the river, abandoned factories tilt like gravestones. Mills collapse behind broken windows over soil broken to build them, where mill hands wore their lives out, standing in fractured noisy stench among endless belts and hoses steaming waste to the fish-killing river. Commerce dies, and commerce raises itself elsewhere. If we read the Boston Globe on a Monday... We find fixed to the business section the part index, deaths, comics. The old father's dignity, as he daily and hourly rehearses the lines of his pain, stiffens him into a tableau vivant. All day he studies the script of no desire, scrupulous never to want what he cannot have. He controls speech, he controls desire, and a young man's intense blue eyes look from his face as he asks his grandniece to purchase, at the medical supply store, rubber pants and disposable pads. Let us praise the death of dirt. The builder tells us that the most effective way to preserve topsoil is to pave it over. Peterson's farm in Hamden raised corn, beans, and tomatoes for sale at New Haven's markets. For a hundred years, they ripened in Adams Avenue's countryside among the slow cattle of dairy farms. Now slopes extrude hairy and tenny. Earth conceals itself under parking lots and the slimy collapsing sheds of Stop and Shop, Brooks, Bob's, Caldor, and Crazy Eddie's. The empire rots turning brown. Junkyards of commerce slide into tar over dirt impervious to erosion, sun, wind, and the breaking tips of green-leafed infrangible corn. Beside his right eye and low on his neck, shiny patches of skin blaze the removed cancer. The 50-year-old poet and I drink seltzer together in the grasshopper tavern. He rants like Thersites denouncing his Greeks. Probably it won't kill him, but toadstool up each year. I want, he looks longingly, desire remakes his face. I want so much to die. Let us never forget to praise the deaths of animals. The young red tomcat, long-haired, his tail like a fox's, with bird feathers of fur upstarting between his toes, who emitted a brief squeak of astonishment, like the sound squeezed from a rubber doll, when he jumped to the floor from a high bookcase, who rattled a doorknob trying to open a door for himself, who, if we then opened the same door, declined our absurd, well-meaning suggestion that he use it, who bounced and never walked, who moused assiduously and, lacking mice, ripped out carpet pads for swatting, who spent most waking hours bird-watching from the pantry window, 
who sprawled upside down in our arms, splaying long legs stiffly out, great ruffled tail dangling, abruptly wasted and died of liver failure. We buried him this morning by the barn in the cat's graveyard under blue asters, tamping dirt down over a last red ear. Downstairs her sisters gather weeping among soft chairs while neighbors bring casseroles and silence. In the bedroom, the widower opens the closet door where her dresses hang and finds one hanger swaying. At Blackwater Farm beside Route 4, the veil bellies wide from the river, 400 acres of black dirt over glacial sand, where Jack and his uncles spread a century of cow manure. They milk their cattle morning and night, feeding them grain, silage, and hay, while the renewable sisters drank at the river's edge, chewed cuds, bore yearly calves, bounced and mooed to praise each other's calving, and produced a frothing, blue-white Atlantic of Holstein milk. Yesterday the roads went in, great yellow earth machines dozing through loam to sand, as Jack's boy Richard raises 50 colonial capes with two-car garages and driveways, Riverview Meadow Farms over smothered alluvial soil. Death tends to occur, as the professor actually said, at the end of life. You, like many of us, I expect, have seen death in many forms. Um, the death of your young father, for example, many years ago from lung cancer, when you were a very young man. The death of the farm animals that you worked with here on the farm, with your grandfather and grandmother, their eventual demise. Yeah. And, and you've, come, uh, you've come fairly close to your own possible demise from illness, too. Yes. Yet the poem is titled Praise for Death. Why, uh, do you well, mean that just ironically? or? I mean it almost entirely ironically. And I think that early in the poem, not in a part that uh, we have done here, uh, that uh, the irony is pretty well established where I uh, say that um, we praise death the way a spaniel praises a pit bull. Yeah, the, creeping uh, towards There it. is that, um, that form of religion which consists of uh, uh, praising that which you're terrified of. And you indicate the extent of your terror by the extent of your praise. You wrote me a while back that uh, you felt this was one of the best poems you had written, or one of the best pieces you've ever done. Yes, I still feel so. That way? Yeah, I still yeah. feel so. Yeah. Yeah. I may be wrong. What but is it in particular? Uh, is it in the form of the poem, or the the whole thing? No, I think the for, I think I found a form that that can hold it, where I um, could uh, have a whole stanza. In a, in a long line, that would be kind of a whole unit, like a whole little poem to itself. But I could also use it as parts of a structure, like bricks to make a house mm -hmm. with. But it is actually, what I like most about the poem is um, the powerful material um, jammed together in ways so that the parts can conflict with each other, and the conflict seems to me to make a lot of energy. That is what I hope mm -hmm. for. That uh, I think that uh, praise for death is uh, finally a kind of um, um, triumphant and life-affirming uh, shout, uh, but um, uh, it, it is um, absolutely lethal all the way through. Mm. So that, that that enormous conflict between uh, these two great uh, drives, the death drive and the life drive, uh, uh, if I can contain them in the form of the poem, I have contained powerful material. That's what I hope. The day I was older. The clock. The clock on the parlor wall, stout as a mariner's clock, disperses the day. All night it tolls the half hour and the hours number with resolute measure, approaching the poles and crossing the equator over fathoms of sleep. Warm in the dark next to your breathing, below the thousand favored stars, 
waters. I feel horns of grey water heave underneath us, and the ship's pistons pound as the voyage continues over the limited sea. The News After tending the fire, making coffee, and pouring milk for cats, I sit in a blue chair each morning, reading obituaries in the Boston Globe for the mean age. Today there is Manufacturer Concord, 53, Ex-Congressman Saugus, 80, and I read that Emily Farr is dead after a long illness in Oregon. Once in an old house we talked for an hour, while a coal fire brightened in November twilight and wavered our shadows high on the wall until our eyes fixed on each other thirty years ago. The Pond We lie by the pond on a late August afternoon as a breeze from low hills in the west stiffens water and agitates birch leaves yellowing above us. You set down your book and lift your eyes to white trunks tilting from shore. A mink scuds through ferns, an acorn tumbles. Soon we will turn to our daily business. You do not know that I am watching, taking pleasure in your breasts that rise and fall as you breathe. Then I see mourners gathered by an open grave. The Day Last night at supper time I outlived my father, enduring the year, month, day, and hour when he lay back on a hospital bed in the guest room among cylinders of oxygen, mouth open, nostrils and lips fixed, unquivering, pale blue. Now I have wakened more mornings to frost whitening the grass, read the newspaper more times, and stood more times, my hand on a doorknob, without opening the door. Father of my name, father of long fingers, I remember your dark hair and your face almost unwrinkled. The Cup From the Studebaker's back seat on our Sunday drives, I watched her earrings sway. Then I walked uphill, beside an old man carrying buckets under birches on an August day. Striding at noontime, I looked at wheat and at river cities. In the crib, my daughter sighed, opening her eyes. I kissed the cheek of my father dying. By the pond, an acorn fell. You listening here, you reading these words as I write them, I offer this cup to you. Though we drink from this cup every day, we will never drink it dry. Poet Donald Hall Reading from Old and New Poems, published by Tickner and Fields. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for joining us. Poems to a Listener was produced by Henry Lyman in cooperation with WFCR, Amherst, Massachusetts. This program was supported by the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry and the National Endowment for the Arts.